Okay, so uh, at this point, I'd like to hand over to uh, Rachel, who's going to uh, take us through a presentation today on emerging ingredients. So, Rachel, over to you. Uh, hello. So, what I'm going to do today is um, cover very briefly some general issues, uh, and then we're going to move on to some examples within the forum of sugar reduction, because it's such a, a large topic at the moment. So why, why do we actually use emerging ingredients, novel ingredients in the first place? Well, it's all around the need to be competitive and innovative and drive product innovation within products. Um, it might be that by using different ingredients that you might be able to provide new solutions for delivering um, nutritious products. It might be that you could remove some allergens from your formulations, so for example, something like gluten, um, or it might be that you could improve, say, the, the nutritional content, so um, say, for example, the iron or the calcium levels within uh, a formulation. Uh, so some potential issues that, that could happen um, that you need to think about when using novel ingredients are uh, regulatory constraints, and we'll go through, I'll touch on some of these in a minute. Um, there might be variation in quality um, of supply. So, for example, for um, some different ancient grains or um, natural um, grown products, it might be that depending on the, um, the growing conditions, you might get different levels of micronutrients, you might get different levels of protein, and that may then um, affect your, your formulation and, and the benefits that you could potentially have. Um, it may also be that you might um, lose functionality um, in some way, and in, uh, good examples of this, things like when you're reducing sugar um, or taking sugar out of your product and putting high-potency sweeteners in, you'll obviously get the benefit of still having sweetness, but you might lose some of the functionality um, within your product. So um, just to touch on some regulatory considerations, because obviously this is a very important aspect when using um, emerging ingredients. Some may fall under novel foods regulations. So this is an EU regulation um, which states that if a product doesn't have a history of use within the EU before 1997, it would be um, considered as a novel food, so you would have to submit an application um, to make sure that that food or ensure that that food has been approved for use. Um, and then within that, you may only be allowed to use them in certain applications or only at certain levels. Whether or not the product's natural as well, so um, it's important to note that although this is on a regulatory consideration slide, um, that there isn't actually any um, specific regulation stating what is and isn't natural. However, though, there is in leg legislation um, that you must not mislead the consumer. Um, interesting to note as well, within the UK, um, and possibly other countries, there is guidance on what could be um, perceived by the consumer as natural. So this would be something which hasn't been interfered with by man. Um, so for example, something like honey is, natural, is a naturally produced product made by bees, whereas something like um, table sugar may not be natural because it uh, wouldn't be considered as natural because it goes through um, chemical purification steps. On top of this, we also have food additives legislation, so for sort of technical products. Um, and within this, products will only be allowed to be used in certain applications um, at certain levels, and sometimes there are, there are additional um, constraints within those. And we also have labeling concerns as well. So for example, for something like stevioglycosides, which is a relatively new uh, high-potency sweetener to the market, Although lots of consumers um, may recognize it as stevia, you're not actually allowed to label it as stevia. It has to be labeled as its proper name, which is stevioglycosides or sweetener E960. So to just give you a little bit of background around this um, sort of emerging ingredients project, this is a, a funded project which has been going on. It's in its second of three years. The aim is to provide a wide range of information on emerging ingredients, and we're doing this by conducting some feasibility trials um, and also um, putting out some ingredients insights fact sheets. So we've done some on um, antioxidants, for example, so far. Um, and then we're also um, doing R&D work. Um, so across the three years, we're looking at, at ancient grains, 
And then we've done case studies throughout the project as well. And so far, we've looked at insects um, for use uh, interest around sort of their protein content and also chia seeds specifically in, um, in drinks. But today, um, I'm just going to talk about sugar replacement. Obviously, um, within the, the short span of time that I have, I don't have enough time to cover every single ingredient and every single topic we've looked at. Um, I've picked sugar because um, it's, as I say, very, very um, important at the moment. We've got um, potential sugar levies coming in for soft, soft drinks. Uh, Public Health England targets obviously coming in as well, and spanning all across Europe, we have targets and and are being um, encouraged to reduce sugar uh, total sugars levels in products. So the considerations within this area um, are very similar to the ones that I've already stated. So regulatory constraints, um, you might have to rebalance energy levels. Um, there may be limited and natural options, and obviously impacts on product characteristics as well. So just to kind of take you through some of the options that we have so far when looking at sugar replacers, I've kind of split these into three main areas. First one, when we're looking to reduce, um, to, to replace sweetness um, is to use high potency sweeteners. So examples here of approved uh, high potency sweeteners, things like aspartame, sucralose, and stevia glycosides. Um, these are significantly sweeter than sugar um, and tend to provide um, negligible or no, no calories. Um, important to know with them that their sweetness isn't always isn't linear. So at some point they will level out and you can't just keep putting in more and get more and more sweetness. And their sweetness may also be affected by um, what blends you've got them in. So they have synergy synergistic effects um, with each other and with, um, with sucrose. And also, they're affected by things like acid levels within products as well. And the consumer perception of different high-potency sweeteners obviously varies. Um, there's been a lot of negative press around things like aspartame, for example. Uh, and another thing, obviously, around the regulatory side is that they are only allowed for use in limited applications um, and only at certain levels as well. So High potency sweeteners tend to, for example, uh, are, are allowed for use in drinks, but they're not allowed for use in um, things like uh, bakery products, so cakes. And you have to put warning levels on them as well. Uh, also for some of them, sorry, for things like aspartame has to have a, um, a warning level for contains a source of uh, phenylalanine. So in terms of um, bulk, low, and no calorie sweeteners, um, our examples here are things like polyols, so things like xylitol, erythritol, uh, or fibers, so things like inulin and fructooligosaccharide soft. These tend to be um, have a similar level uh, of sweetness to sucrose or might be slightly less sweet. They tend to have a lower calorie content, however, though, so you could potentially use more of them, and they will obviously um, add bulk into, into your formulation. Some considerations, obviously, around their use, though. Uh, polyols, you have to put a laxative effect warning on your product um, if it's in at levels over 10%. Uh, and also, some of them have a mouth cooling effect. So if you think, for example, in chewing gums, um, xylitol is quite commonly used, and that gives that sort of cool um, mouth cooling, which obviously works quite well in a minty system, but if you put it into something like a cookie and it, it hadn't all fully dissolved, then you might not want a mouth cooling cookie, for example. Uh, and again, there are limited applications for polyols. Polyols um, are listed as, as food additives and are, are regulated as such in terms so they, they're not allowed for use uh, in beverages. They are allowed for use in things like baked products. And then my final um, group that I always put in is um, other sugars, which sounds counterintuitive because we're talking about taking sugars out of products. Um, but these are things uh, that are high in fructose. And the reason why some people might wish to use fructose is because although it has the same calorie content as sucrose, it's actually slightly sweeter. So the idea is that you could potentially make a gradual reduction in um, sugar content without losing as much sweetness. 
they have obviously they have potential for having a better consumer perception as well. So these are things like um, honey and agave syrup, uh, or possibly fruit juices. Now, fruit juices, some may also say, aren't having particularly great press at the moment in terms of their sugar levels. Um, but um, it's it's a, just another sort of potential tool that that product developers have. Um, obviously, the the concern here is that there may be flavour changes because these products will come with their own inherent flavour characteristics, which they could then lend to the product. And it's about thinking about how those will holistically work within your um, your overall product matrix. And then not all necessarily natural as well. So just to kind of summarise that um, a little bit. So obviously, as mentioned, not not all of these options that we have available are natural. Sugar has lots of functions, so quite often you have uh, you end up with a larger ingredients list because you have to use a couple of different tools, not just sweeteners, but also things like um, uh, thickeners um, or bulking agents within your product as well. It's worth noting that your manufacturing costs may increase as well because sugar is very cheap related to a lot of these other ingredients. Um, and um, sometimes if you don't rebalance your product, you do have to think about what the, the fat ratio is in your product so that, so that your overall calorie content doesn't increase. So moving on to some of the work that, that we've been doing as part of this project. So what we wanted to look at from the emerging ingredients sort of side was looking at, um, from a less scientific perspective, um, if we did some online searches to see what consumers, what, what people were saying um, that are recommending for use in um, when as an alternative to, to traditional table sugar in formulations. So we wanted to gather a bit of information on some of these ingredients, see if there were any potential, uh, there was any potential out there for um, any additional nutritional benefits or if most of the interest was just around sort of the novelty factor. So the first one that, that we've identified here is lacuma. So this is a fruit native to uh, South America, so found mostly in Peru and Chile. Um, and it, since it ripens quite quickly and is quite a delicate fruit, um, exporting it fresh has, has proven challenging, so it tends to be sourced as a, as a powder. Um, something that we found as we've done more research on, on this ingredient, um, which is quite interesting, is that there seem to be two different biotypes of it. So one of them, um, which is predominantly grown in Chile, has quite a sweet and creamy flavor, or is reported to have quite a sweet flavor and a higher brix content, um, and tends to be used for the fresh food market out in, in Chile and, um, and South America. And then there's a second biotype, which tends to have a lower brix. Um, and hence, therefore, a lower sweetness level. And unfortunately, guys, this is the one that they tend to create um, to make into a powder and then send out um, worldwide to, to then be used within products. So, um, so the sweetness level is something that, that's of interest for obviously the powder is if you're going to use it as an alternative to, to sugar within products. Um, it's reported to be um, quite a good to have a good source of fiber, um, iron and zinc, um, and uh, phosphorus and potassium as well. So it might be that if you tried incorporating some of these um, into your your products, they could lend themselves towards these claims. Another thing that we've done as we've been looking up some of these ingredients was um, conducting again some more in-depth media searches into each particular ingredient. So this was um, using some, some media search software to look at what people were saying about what the, the flavor, what the taste of the products were, what nutri nutrients and nutritional benefits consumers were saying that they were thinking they were getting from these products and what kind of health connotations there were, and also looking at what kind of um, products they were saying that they might use them in as well. So um, in terms of lacuma, the kind of taste that we were getting back were things like coconut, sweet, creamy, caramel. Um, so the nutrients 
we have, um, I don't know how, how easy it is to read um, on your screen, so we have calcium, fiber, iron, and protein. And obviously there are more hits for protein, which is why this word is bigger. Um, interestingly, as I said, the, from the nutritional information that we found, the only one that you seem to be able to make a source of claim for is, uh, is iron. And then, um, as I say, the, the types of products that they seem to be associated with are things like chocolate, smoothies, ice creams, juices, and um, some cakes as well. Most of the hits that we tended to get back were from sources from Facebook, and then Twitter after that, and then blogs, and then finally YouTube. And what we have finally on the bottom right-hand side of your screen is a world map which is showing um, sort of a heat map of or well, not so hot map of where where these products are being talked about. So we can see that America seems to have lit up as well as um, uh, Peru and um, and Chile and Argentina, and also um, the UK uh, for those of you that can see it as well. Our next ingredient of interest was yacon. So this is a perennial plant from South America. So again, South American product. Um, tends to come through as a syrup, which is quite dark brown in color. It's a very molasses-y kind of color. Um, as with the lacuma, interestingly, it has a history of use in the EU, so it's not food, uh, so you can use it as a food ingredient. Um, it's reported to have quite similar physical characteristics to honey, with, it, as I say, taste like molasses, and it looks quite dark in color as well. It contains levels of fructose and FOS, and these can vary depending on what ingredient you get in. So obviously, if you were getting in ingredients to use, you'd want to make sure you work with your supplier to make sure that you've got a good ingredient specification. So reported from the nutritional information that we've seen, it seems to be quite high in fiber, um, and it also contains sort of low levels of minerals like phosphorus, magnesium, iron, and calcium. So although these aren't enough to make a claim, it might be that if you put them in, say, a dairy drink or something like that where it would boost the calcium levels. So from the media searches that we did around Yakon, we were getting back information um, stating, so the, the taste concepts we have here, for those of you that can't see them, are coconut, coffee, maple, molasses, and sweet. Um, and then the nutrients are things like fiber, so that's good for you because we're getting a source of that. Uh, interestingly, lots of people talking about protein around it as well. And then the health connotations, therefore, are around things like weight loss, blood pressure, and blood sugar. As far as I know, you can't make any claims around this at the moment. So it's just it's more of interest to see what consumers are saying about these products. And then the kinds of products that they're linked with are things like chocolate, juice, smoothies, drinks, and, um, and baking we have on there. In this case, the majority of the information was coming from Twitter, and then we have some from Facebook as well, uh, YouTube, and then blogs. And then the areas that they tended to be coming from around the world were around uh, the States and then the UK. And our final one that I have uh, to talk about today is mesquite powder. So this um, mesquite, the mesquite tree is native from uh, native to Mexico and southern USA. So it has long seed pods which are um, produced, and then these are dried and ground into a powder. Um, with this one, it's worth noting that there's no history of use in the EU at the moment, so they're not currently approved for, for use in the EU. Um, but it's described as having a nutty taste with caramel and mocha notes and aromatic, aromatic so like a smell of coconut. Um, nutritional information has been fairly sparse with this one. We found as we've gone through these three different ingredients that I've been uh, talking about today that sort of the information um, seems to get less and less as we've gone down. So there's the most information about lacuma and then next yacon and then it's quite limited, the information on uh, mesquite powder. Um, but it's been suggested that it could be high in fiber and protein. And then as you can see here, 
um, the, the media searches, we didn't get a massive amount of hits back from for this one. So um, there were only around sort of over a nine month period, we've only got about sort of 24 results, 24 hits, so it's really quite small. Um, the majority of these coming from Twitter, a few from Facebook and blogs, and they tend to be uh, just really all around the, the USA at the moment. So just to put this uh, into context, um, I wanted to just quickly touch on a another um, sweetener from a natural source, which has been of interest, um, which, again, isn't currently allowed for use in the EU, but is getting, seems to be getting a bit of traction in the US. Um, is, so we have monk fruit, which um, is a member of the melon family, and we create an extract from this. Um, so similar to stevial glycosides, you have an extraction process to create a high potency sweetener. Um, it has a sweetness of around 150 to 200 times that of um, sucrose. So the kind of media hits that we get back from this, you can see straight away that the, the counts are, are a lot higher, and also the, the global map seems to, to be lit up in more places around the world. So we've got, uh, as you'd expect, more hits in uh, quite a few hits in China where it's produced, but also India, Australia, uh, as well as um, Canada lighting up as well on this uh, this map. So to give you a quick summary of the media searches, so they all tended um, to receive a positive overall sentiment. Yakon seemed to have the highest proportion of negative sentiment. Unfortunately, we can't dig into it more to see what that was around, um, which is a bit of a shame, but uh, unfortunately, it's a bit of a limitation of sort of the software that we have. Um, it could be that in doing more searches, you could um, have a look and see what potentially negative statements those could be. But um, Twitter seemed to be the main source of information for, for Yakon and uh, then Mesquite and Facebook. Uh, and Mesquite, and then Facebook seem to be the largest um, source of information for Lacuma. And Lacuma seems to have by far the most amount of media exposure at the moment. So in terms of what we'll be doing um, on this project with these three ingredients going forward, we've obviously done some literature background, we've done some, some media searches, we're now going to have a look at the flavor profile um, of them a little bit more. Um, we're going to send some samples of Lakuma and Yakon to our sensory panel, and that's actually ongoing at the moment. Unfortunately, um, we can't taste the, the mesquite. Um, and we're going to map out what the flavor profile is for, for, for each of those to give um, product developers a bit more insight into what products those might work in when they're doing um, reformulation or formulation work and want to, to try using them. So the examples that I've used today are, are based on internal research project, um, projects that we've done, um, but some of the approaches that we've used within these would obviously be similar to when we work with clients on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and our typical process could involve um, engaging with clients from a first stage, sort of big picture thought, all the way through to, to MPD and launch at, at the end of this diagram. Um, so whether you're using emerging ingredients for formulating for health or developing new products in general, the, the product would, the, um, the journey would tend to be the same. And the idea is obviously through the information that we can provide is to try and help to speed up the MPD process and, and minimize costs. Um, so emerging ingredients obviously can, arrange, uh, can offer a wide range of advantages, but it's very important to consider the potential pitfalls such as regulatory constraints, whether they're allowed for use um, in the particular area or marketplace that you're going into, um, any technical, let's say, flavor challenges that, that you could have in trying to incorporate them into your products, and also supply. And obviously, with these three products we've seen, we've had various ease in trying to get samples in. And um, we've obviously conducted some searches 
to, to give some information generally around um, some, some other foods to be used instead of traditional sugar. So I hope you found that information useful today. I'll uh, hand back over to Richard now. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, that was a fantastic overview of some of the uh, emerging ingredients that are trending at the moment. So as Rachel said, hopefully you found uh, some of this useful today. Um, I just want to spend a couple of minutes now uh, telling you where you can find out more information. Um, a lot of you will have uh, um, heard about this webinar through our news feeds, um, but uh, we've got a whole range of uh, news feed topics available, and one of those is ingredients and raw materials. So not all of you will be subscribed to that. It, uh, it could be one that is uh, worth uh, joining if, uh, if this um, line of work is uh, of interest to you. You can opt in and opt out of those at any time. You can just go to the Camden BRI website to, uh, to access those. Um, we've got quite a range of uh, members and non-members here today. Um, so uh, for those of you that aren't aware, one of the benefits of membership are the member interest groups, uh, which are essentially networking events for member companies. So if you're not already a member, then this is one of the, the key benefits. Um, these uh, groups meet three times a year, and uh, they discuss topical issues on their particular area of interest. So we've got 14 different groups, and uh, as I said, they meet three times a year, and they also help to steer the research that we do at Camden BRI. They also get presentations on legislation, presentations from external speakers, discuss topical issues. Um, it's a great way to keep up to date with what's going on in the world and a good form of business intelligence. So they're, they're well worth subscribing to if, um, if you're not already a part of it. Again, more detail on the, uh, on the Camden BRI website. Um, if you prefer to uh, listen to our member interest groups manager talk about the MIGs uh, very quickly, then there is a video available on the website. We won't watch this now, but it is there if you want to spend a couple of minutes hearing more about them. Uh, we mentioned earlier on that uh, some of the work we've talked about today has been derived from a member-funded project. Um, it has, has actually got its own project website, uh, which you can uh, access through, uh, through the Camden BRI site. Um, and all of the, uh, the output from that project has been um, uh, collated into one uh, easy-to-reach place. Uh, some of it will be member-only access, but there will be parts that uh, are in the, the public domain. So uh, it's well worth checking that out. And as for all of our uh, member-funded work that we have here, uh, we produce a research summary sheet, essentially a one-page summary of all of the work that has been done during the year. And uh, all of the research is summarized in R&D reports as well. Again, if you're a member, you can access all of those on the website at any time. So um, at this point, I'd like to uh, address some of the, the questions that you might have. Um, some of them have been coming in already, but if, uh, if you haven't had the chance, now might be a good time to, uh, to type some in. So um, let's have a look at those then, Rachel. The uh, first one we've got is, uh, is about the member-funded project. Uh, we've been asked if any publications are due to be coming out anytime soon. Okay, so we, obviously the, the project's in its second of three years, so um, at the moment, we've, um, we've produced a couple of R&D reports around ancient grains. Um, and we've also produced some R&D reports around insects and also on chia seeds. Um, the R&D report that will be related to, to the information in this presentation and around the alternatives to sugar, we're currently still preparing at the moment because the sensory assessment's still ongoing. So I would hope that that one will be coming out at the end of this year. Hey, brilliant. Um, and on a similar theme, um, <coughs> We've been asked about um, ingredient insight fact sheets. Um, do we know where they can be accessed? Do those um, kind of things exist? So the ingredients insight fact sheets are what we're doing instead of the research summary sheets for this project. We're, we're, doing, we're trying a slightly different um, method. Um, so the ingredients insight fact sheets will also be available on the project website. And these are basically um, whenever we've done any work, um, so for example on insects or chia seeds where we've done uh, an in-depth, sort of more in-depth R&D project, we've also got some top-line information in an Ingredients Insight fact sheet on each of those. And then we've also done some just plain literature-based um, Ingredients Insight fact sheets as well. So we've done one on antioxidants and then later this year we'll be publishing one on potential pitfalls for um, nutritional analysis, so things to look out for when, when you're doing nutritional analysis on different ingredients as well. Okay, excellent. Um, the next one could be quite a tricky question to, um, to answer, but 
but uh, we've been asked if uh, we've got any indication of how a sugar tax might work on solid foods, perhaps a cost per percentage of sugar. Are we able to offer any insight on that? Um, at the moment, as far as I know, the sugar tax is just going to be relating to soft drinks. So I don't have any um, anything else to really uh, provide in terms of information around solid foods. I think at the moment the um, the we're hope uh, the government is probably hoping that the PHE targets will be sufficient to help people to reduce sugars in um, in solid foods. Okay, excellent. Um, the next question we've got is about the range of ingredients we've looked at and whether we're planning to look at any more ingredients over the, the coming months. Um, have we got any other plans in place? We certainly are, yes. Um, we haven't actually decided which ingredients we're going to look at in the third year yet. So it would be brilliant if people could um, contact me, and obviously my contact details are on the slides, um, with any, int uh, any ingredients that, that you're interested in at the moment, um, because obviously with all these projects, it's, it's always great to get feedback from, from members and from, from companies as to what they're actually interested in for, for us to do some more, um, more research in, into. Okay. And the next question is, um, to clarify a point made earlier about one of the ingredients we looked at uh, and whether it's permitted in the EU, I think they missed the, uh, um, the discussion when you were talking about it. Uh, lacuma, is that permitted in the EU? Yes, lacuma is permitted in, in the EU. It's okay. permitted for use. It's, got a, it's not a novel yeah. food, it's just a food ingredient. So um, there aren't any specific limitations on its use. Okay, and on the topic of novel foods, uh, the next question is whether uh, there's a database or something similar that exists to tell whether something is a, a novel food or not. Are you aware of anything? Um, I believe that there is a database um, on the EU EFTA website that you can go to. Um, the, probably the easiest way, um, if you're not sure about how to find it, is to contact our regulatory affairs department, um, and which if you could um, put some contact details for how to contact our regulatory affairs team, because that's probably the easiest way to, to get a link. Or if you contact me directly, then I can put, put you through as okay. well. So it's something we'll be able to look at at a, a later time. Um, the next question is, do we have any expertise in uh, food safety specific risks associated with um, emerging ingredients? Um, is that one for you, or would that be another member of the team? Um, in terms of the specific food safety risks, I think we would have to look at that on a on a one to one basis on the ingredients. If there have been any specific ones, I think that we would probably flag any of that information in in the R and D reports as they come out. Okay, excellent. And uh, I'm getting conscious of the time, so we'll uh, try and make this the uh, the last question. Um, we've been asked um, again for novel ingredients, uh, how long and costly the uh, the process is for approval. Um, and if it has uh, something called GRAS status in the US, G-R-A-S? Um, all of the ingredients that I've spoken about today have GRAS um, status, I believe. Um, in terms of how long it can take to get products through, again, I'm afraid that I can't answer that. Um, but there might be some other people within the team that, that might be able to provide some insight in that. So if you contact me directly, um, then we should be able to see if we can find out any further information for you on that. Yeah, it's clearly, clearly quite an exciting subject for the food industry, and I'm sure we could talk about uh, this uh, all day. Uh, we've clearly got contacts at Camden BRI that can help you if uh, uh, you want to contact, um, contact us at a later time. But I think that's all we've got time for today. So um, I'd like to finish up by saying uh, we're planning to release a recording of this uh, webinar in, uh, in due course over the next couple of weeks. So if you have missed anything today, you should be able to, uh, to listen back to uh, what we've talked about. Uh, we'll also make the slides available uh, later on today, so you'll have those to, uh, to refer to as well. So um, all that remains to be said is thank you very much for joining us today. Um, thank you very much to Rachel for a fantastic overview of emerging ingredients. And uh, we hope you can join us for some of our future events and uh, seminars and webinars. So uh, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, all the best. Thank you.